Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Gina Bauer. Can you hear me okay? Good. I'm very grateful to be with you today. And we are going to be talking about the role of family and community in youth ministry. How many people here are in youth ministry? Oh, boy. Gear up. You got to gear up if you're in youth ministry. You have to have a certain type of tenacity and strength and definitely humor <laughs> to stay in youth ministry. So let's start off this afternoon with a prayer. And um, I, think, I think we're just going to pray one Hail Mary, and we're going to pray it really well. I have a lot of information, as you can see, in this handout. It's basically the document from John Paul II, but I'm going to go through and teach on parts of it. Um, how many people are actually doing programs with your youth at, or your schools that include the family? Okay, how many people would like to maybe include that a little bit more? Okay, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach some of the foundational pieces, and then towards the end, I'm going to actually give ideas of what I've seen different parishes doing. And I'm also going to take some time for question and answer. So we'll hopefully give you some good inspiration. And then also be able to strengthen you with practical ideas to, like, take it home. Okay? All right. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Victory, pray for us. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to start off just with this little story. I was watching YouTube one night, and there was this little baby bear, and it was playing out in the field. And all of a sudden, I see this cougar. And the cougar is prowling on the little baby bear. And so the little baby bear picks up on the scent of the cougar and starts to run. And if you, if you watch this on YouTube, you can hear the little guy going, mm, mm, mm. and the cougar is chasing it. And at one point, I'm like, why am I watching a cougar chase a baby bear? Okay? But I kept watching. So anyway... <laughs> It gets to the river scene, and what happens is, is the little bear is swimming in the river, and the cougar is running along the side. The little bear gets out of the water, gets onto the log, thinks it's safe, and there is the cougar. And the cougar starts whack, whack, whacking the baby bear. And all of a sudden, the camera switches, and there's Mama Bear. <laughs> And that cougar just takes off. And I thought, that is one of the best images that I can think of our Blessed Mother and how she is working night and day with her son, Jesus Christ, to defend the church and in a specific way, the family in our time. Because we know that the family is really, really been put in the fire. The family has been put in the fire. But it is truly the fire of God's love. Because God is with us. God is with us through it all. Now for you and for me, the fire is too much. Okay? For you and for me, the fire is too much. But for our Blessed Mother, and for her son, Jesus Christ, it's not. We were born for this. We were created and put into this time for a specific person. And that is for Jesus Christ and the person sitting next to you. We are in this together. I use that video to teach consecration to the Blessed Mother to high school kids. It works. Many, many miraculous medals went on, and many scapulars started to be worn once they understood that the Blessed Mother has this mantle of protection to put around them. It is not a mantle just to hide in. It is a mantle of grace 
which equips us for the battle. It makes us warriors. And so this is why Our Lady is calling us in this time to draw very, very, very close to her son and to the church. And this is what St. John Paul II wanted to teach us. Now is the time for the family to follow Christ because it's dark. And so when it is dark, you don't stare at the abyss of darkness until you can't move. That's what happened to that woman in the Bible when she turned back to look at the city. Remember that? She freaked out and she froze. (laughs) So we have to do the opposite. We have to keep our eyes on Christ. Not on the enemy. On Jesus Christ. If we keep our eyes on him, then we will be able to lead. And as Dr. Deacon Bob Bryce talked about last night, our Father in Heaven is calling us to lead. He is calling us to model. He is calling us to protect. He is calling us to be like God. And we can do this with grace. With grace, we can. I told Jesus one time, I said, you want to make me holy? Good luck. (laughs) That's how he wants us to be. Because nothing is impossible with God. The family has a mission. The mission is to guard, reveal, and communicate love. Guard, reveal, and communicate love. We cannot fulfill our mission if we do not know Jesus Christ. We have to know Jesus Christ. We have to love Jesus Christ. We have to breathe Jesus Christ. We have to eat Jesus Christ. Yes, literally eat him in the Holy Eucharist. Amen? Amen. Yeah, Jesus is like, eat me, be me, live me, do it, you know? And this is why we follow him, because he was crazy enough to create you. And he is crazy enough to save you. And he is crazy enough to bring you home. You know, and we are going to honor, we are on our way home to the heavenly kingdom where every tear will be wiped away, where we will live a life full of joy. There will be no more sin, no more pain, no more weakness. Why? Because the finite is passing and the infinite is here, here and now in the Holy Eucharist, the fullness of every joy, of everything your heart was ever created for, already exists in one little host. And you and I go to communion, and we receive eternal life. The Holy Father, John Paul II, said, when you go to Holy Communion, you receive fire and spirit. That's what you receive. And that fire and that spirit, it's stored up in you. And how are you going to raise out of your coffin someday? By the fire and the spirit of that holy Eucharist. So I would tell your teenagers, they better get gassed up because they're going to need it. Okay? So the Eucharist is the source of Christian marriage. The Eucharist itself, Jesus Christ is the source of Christian marriage. And when we teach our kids about marriage and family life, we have to teach them Jesus Christ. We have to show them Jesus Christ. And we have to love them to Jesus Christ. Pope Francis recently wrote a document called Christ is Alive. And in this document, he said it is not going to be enough just to put our kids into classrooms and teach them doctrine. I talked to a youth minister last week, and in her church, they have started a pretty successful youth program. It takes three years to build a successful youth program. They're on their year one, and already she has pressure from different people, the voices, right, who want everything to go right back into the classroom, classroom only. And so what we need to understand is that classroom can be the beginning 
if the person who is in the classroom is acting in Jesus Christ. The most important thing you can do to prepare for your students, whether it's youth group, classroom, school, it doesn't matter what it is, is your prayer life. You have to pray for these kids and you have to ask Jesus to help you to love them. I was doing a retreat one time. I had middle school kids. I had two boys directing the retreat instead of me. Anybody ever feel that way? <laughs> Finally, I'm halfway through it. I was like, I can't go on. I've got to stop. I stopped. I said to everybody, turn to your neighbor. And I always just give them a question. OK, ask them their favorite color. It doesn't even matter what it is. Then I went up to the two boys. And I said, boys, you are so mine. As soon as it's lunchtime, you are here. And they're like, I said, mine. <laughs> so anyway, lunchtime came, and everybody left. And the boys were sitting there like this. And I went, and they came. And they both sat down. I go, not together. You, over there. You. And so the little guy's sitting there. And I pull up a chair, and he pulls up a chair. And I said, let's pray. Let's pray. So I don't know what I'm doing. How many times do you really know what you're doing? Raise your hand. Tell the <laughs> truth. <laughs> this, is called, this is called punting in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so I start to pray. And I get done, I, and I pray quietly. That kills them. OK? And then I open up my eyes, and I said, what's wrong with you? That's what came out of my mouth. What is wrong with you? And he looks at me. He goes, I'm adopted. I go. And he says, he goes, I'm adopted. And he starts crying. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So he's crying. And I said, okay, well, let's pray about that. So then I shut my eyes. I start praying quietly. And what comes to me is that is where his wound is. And so I looked at him and I said, all right. I said, do your parents love you? And he said, yes. I said, your mother could have aborted you. She loved you enough to give you life. And your parents love you now. And so you are given life again. And what are you doing with the life that God gave you? And he just looks down immediately. And then he looks back up. And he looks at me with these tears coming down his little face. And I said, listen here. God wanted you to live. You are alive. You are gifted. You are talented. And you are driving everybody crazy. <laughs> So I said, will you, will you consider changing? And he goes, OK. And I said, well, it's good to be good. So why don't we work on that? I said, today, you will work for me. And he said, OK. And so I gave him a job all day long. I just kept giving him jobs. And he stayed right by my side. Then I called the other little guy up. And I said, sit down. I prayed for a second. I looked at him. I said, knock it off. He goes, OK. So this is the thing. We have to take the time in our youth programs, classrooms, when we are with youth, we have to be love in the classroom. And we can do this if we are praying for our students. The Holy Spirit wants to help them more than you do. I know a story of a, of a man who was doing pro-life work. And he started to lean more on the Holy Spirit, really, really praying before he went to do the sidewalk counseling. And one day he said he went out there and a woman was going into the, into the clinic and she had long, beautiful red hair and the word that came to him was bow ties. Have you heard this story before? Bow ties. He says bow ties. He just screamed it out. She turns around and she looks back at him and she's like, and he, and he doesn't even know how the Holy Spirit is working, but he figures it has something to do with her beautiful red hair. And so she comes back to him, and he says, your baby will need bow ties. And she said to him, my father never had much time for me, but the one thing he always said to me was I had beautiful hair, and he liked my bow ties. 
So this is where I feel that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a mystery, right? We have Jesus. He's showing us who the Father is, right? And then you got this Holy Spirit, you know? But I think the Holy Spirit wants us to trust him. He wants us to trust him. And so this trust is most beautifully shown in the way that we pray for our students and the way we pray for our kids and the way that we walk into that classroom. Not as, oh, can I do this job? No, obviously I can't do this job. That's why I need God, okay? I need you, God. I need you to work through me today, even though I have this problem, this problem, this problem. God knows all about me and all about you. He knows our brokenness. That doesn't bother him. What bothers him is that we don't trust him and entrust our little selves to him so that he can work in a big way, a big, big way, because God is infinite. We are finite. God has no beginning. We have a little beginning, and we have a little end. And so he is not afraid of our finite because he is the infinite. And so when we accept the finite love of God into our hearts, then he takes our little broken finite hearts and gives us infinite power. And it is an infinite power that lets us love people the way he loves people. When we want to give up, he gives us grace to not give up, to try one more thing, to keep going. And that is what this talk is about today. This talk is about the need that we have to understand the situation and then apply what the church is telling us to do to strengthen the family so that the civilization of love, which St. John Paul II spoke over humanity, can come into existence. And it can only come if you and I are fully committed to Christ and fully committed to accepting our situation. Acceptance is grace. And then letting that power and that love of God work through us anyway, okay? Because it's not enough just to accept it. Because you might just accept it and lay down and go to sleep. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? Or go out and have a drink. (laughs) Maybe two. (laughs) I will tell you what, the first time I came to Steubenville, like a long time ago, I bought down a bus of kids, and our bus broke down, I think, five, six times along the way. We literally had to get a new bus three times. When we got to campus, the lights of the bus were all on again. The bus driver said, where are you and where are you going to? I said, well, we're from Minnesota and we're going to this Franciscan University conference. Father Mark, who is the priest in the the bus said, take this bus up the hill, I don't care what happens to it. Because all the lights were on. They brought us up. We came out here, we are all sitting out under the tent, because in those days we had a tent. Father Mark comes back to me and he says, good thing we prayed to our guardian angels. I said, why? He said the axle of the bus was hanging on by a thread, and they said it should never have made it up the hill. Yeah, yeah. And I have to tell you, Youth Ministry 101, I got those kids sitting on the hill, couldn't get them in the tent because it was full. They're all sitting out on the hill, and I started to head down to the hill to the hotel. One of my leaders grabbed me and says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the bar. (laughs) What are you going to do? I'm getting a strong one. I said, I feel like I'm in hell, and I'm never coming back here again. (laughs) And I've been back every year since for 18 years. (laughs) And I never did get to that bar. (laughs) So... The need that we have to understand the situation. I'm going to read this quote. Living in such a world, second quote, page one, under the pressure of coming above all from the mass media, the faithful do not always remain immune from the obscuring of certain fundamental values, nor set themselves up as the critical conscience of family culture and as active agents in building an authentic 
family life. Yes to good, no to evil. Because the media is so strong, our people can't always see what is good and what is evil. And so if we are going to help them to embrace an authentic family life, and I'm, not, I'm talking about your teens. If we are going to want to call our teens to authentic love, we have to be able to help them to see that the media is not leading them on the right path, but that Jesus Christ is, God is. And you might say, well, how could we ever do this? It seems like at times that the media is so overpowering. It's so forceful. It is a finite reality. It is a finite reality. It is not more powerful than Jesus Christ. It's just that right now we have to be able to take the kids closer to Christ. And so how do we do that? It means that we will take the kids. I had a group of kids one time that were middle school kids. And just to get them to sit still for five minutes to teach them anything was a miracle. And one morning, in my prayer, so this is why you have to pray. If you don't pray, you can't serve the church because you won't hear Jesus Christ and you won't be serving the church. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just telling you the truth. I, when I was a new youth minister, I had a dream one night. Hammer was pounding on the roof and tiles were flying everywhere. And then a big hand from heaven came down and it just started to nail. And I knew Jesus was saying, I know you're trying very hard, but you're really making a mess of things. Okay? So, but because I had learned to pray about everything, because I couldn't tell what was good and what was evil. I couldn't tell what to do with the kids and what not to do. I couldn't tell what voices to listen to because it's all coming at you at once. This is how important youth ministry is. The enemy does not want your kids to fall in love with Jesus, and he does not want them to have a good experience of church when they're young. It's like a restaurant. If you go to a few good restaurants, if you go to a bad one, what will you do? Go find a good one. You don't quit going out to eat, right? Okay. But if you have never had a good experience of family life and church life, and you have a bad experience, you will never go back. So our job is to give them a good experience. So I'm down. I'm sitting in front of Jesus of the Blessed Sacrament, and I hear, bring the little children to me. And I still remember to this day saying to Jesus, looking right at the Blessed Sacrament and going, I can't, Jesus. And he's like, why not? I said, they'll get bored. And right away he says to me, so you think I'm boring? <laughs> he just, this is a Holy Spirit thing. Whack, whack. Okay? And the Holy Spirit whacks you, you should listen. And if God tells you to do something, you should do it right away. Okay? So I struggled with this all day long. And then that night, I was at youth group, and it was like the shepherd's crook. You know how the shepherd, the bishop has that? Well, I call it the shepherd's crook. I can't see it, but I can feel it. It's when Jesus wants me to do something, and I don't want to do it. And it's just this pressure. <laughs> okay? So, I mean, I could grab it from him and clunk him over the head, but instead, I said to the kids, okay. If I told you that Jesus Christ was over in the church right now, how many of you would want to go? Every hand went up. I said, he is. They're like, oh, he's in disguise. Disguise? I said, yes. He's in that little gold box and a piece of bread. It's his disguise, but it's really him. They're like, cool. So I said, let's go visit him. What do you want to ask him? So they started writing down questions. And so we're going over to church, they're doing cartwheels, back handsprings, flips. You know how junior high kids are. I'm like, Lord, have mercy, I'm going to lose my job. We get into the church, and, and some parishioner, you know, I just. <laughs> anyway, so I started taking, <laughs> start taking them into the church, you know. I remember one time. We're getting these kids to go to the church and pray, and this little lady comes to me, and she goes, what are you doing now? You're making so much noise again. I go, what are you doing? She says, well, I'm praying. I go, well, what are you praying for? She said, I'm praying for the salvation of souls. I go, he's doing it. <laughs> she goes, oh. <laughs> so 
I get these kids into this church, and we're having a, and I just, they had their questions, and they spread out through church, and they said, now, he's in the box, this is why we genuflect, because every knee shall bend to him, so make sure you genuflect, go up, take your time, but ask him your questions, and listen, and they, and they're asking, well, how do you know he's talking back to you, and I said, well, what I do is I think about the answer I get, and I think, could I have come up with that? And that's how you know it's God, because God is smarter than us. Okay, that was enough, junior high, right? So off they go. First time I did this, they were in that church for 10 minutes. Quiet, spread out through the church. Middle school kids. And when they were done, it was time to go, I went to get them, and something said, just give them a few more minutes. And so I gave them a few more minutes, and then we came out onto the grass waiting for the parents to come, and they were like, what was that? This one little girl goes, I was just filled with peace. I said, that's who you receive every Sunday when you go to communion. But if you go back to your pew and you're distracted and you're thinking about what's for lunch and you don't pray, then Jesus comes into your heart, but he's, he's like a guest that's invited into your heart, but then you, you're not kind or polite and you don't talk to him. That began teaching young people prayer. The kids requested then to go every few weeks, and we would go over. And I was able to pick up the five steps to prayer. And I did not bring that handout with me, but if you, ever, if you want to pick that up, you can go to ginabauer.com, and I can send it to you. But in the five steps to prayer that we based it on a friend of mine who I went to school with helped me to write these five simple steps to prayer out based by St. Teresa of Avila. We were able to start working with middle school and high school kids on this five steps to prayer that help kids to take off in their prayer life. And I was able to use it with adults, parents, whoever you're working with. So many people go to sit down to pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and they stay at step number one. Tell your problems to the Lord. <laughs> okay? And when they leave an hour later, they're at step number one. And they're still thinking about their problems, and the Lord's like, ugh. <laughs> All right? Amen? Okay, we better keep going here. So I want to go to um, following Christ, the church seeks the truth, which is not always the same as the majority opinion. Following Christ, the church seeks the truth. So when I was in the Twin Cities one day driving down um, to go shopping downtown, I see a big bus, and it's completely pink, and it's promoting contraception for Planned Parenthood, okay? That is what the world is promoting. Another big sign up in the Twin Cities says, Planned Parenthood will never leave like it's God. No, Jesus Christ will never leave, okay? Everything human is finite and is passing. And so the world is going to promote ideas like it is God. But God is God. And so we want to be able to pass this on to our families. The situation in which the family finds itself presents positive and negative aspects. The first is the sign of salvation of Christ operating in the world. The second, a sign of the refusal that man gives to the love of God. We are going to find both things happening in the world. If you look, you will see Christ working. If you look, you will see the refusal of man and woman to love God, and that is all it is. Okay? That's all it is. So we shouldn't be so terrified of it. Instead, we should keep our eyes on God, and we should refuse to not love God. Okay? We will love God. We will do what's right. And when we are so strong in that, that grace will pass on to others. Okay? So the second, on the back side, our age needs wisdom. And you don't have to follow along if you don't want to. I just... I like to go to a conference and go home with notes so I can use them for my talks. <laughs> so I wanted to give you guys some material. Our age needs wisdom. 
more than bygone ages if the discoveries made by man are to be further humanized. For the future of the world stands in peril unless wiser people are forthcoming. There you go. And who are those wise people? They're right in this room. You're right here. You want to make a difference. You want the next generation to do better. It is not in our hands, and yet it is. It is not in our hands. It's in God's hands. God the Father has a plan. I remember being in St. Paul um, during the riots that we had a few years ago. Has that already been a couple, I think? And I'm in St. Paul. They were, the riots were in Minneapolis crossing over to St. Paul coming up Robert Street. So my house is on a hill, and I was praying through the night. And I could hear the, the sirens and the police officers. I could hear everything going on. And I literally prayed through the night. And another trick I do, Gina Bauer trick, is I YouTube the Blessed Sacrament. Put them up. Go get them, Jesus. So sometimes I even do it when I'm driving my car, I'll be driving down the highway, Jesus, get him, Jesus, get him. There he is, right on the old. <laughs> so I just want to say that that night when I sat down, I said, God, you must have a plan. I know if my dad was in charge of the universe, he would have a plan. Dad always had a plan. And as soon as I said this, I felt peace just go all the way through me, from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. God has a plan. And nothing will stop this plan from coming into existence. And so as messy as it gets, his plan is in operation, and quietly and silently, it's coming. It's coming every day. <clears throat> and what is that plan? Jesus Christ, the bridegroom of the church, and the sacrament of matrimony. The spirit which the Lord pours forth gives a new heart and renders man and woman capable of loving one another as ordained. Jesus Christ, in giving us the Holy Spirit, gives us a new heart and it is this new heart that allows us to love one another. And so the plan that the Father had was to restore all things in Christ, but it was very specifically the human heart, that the human heart would be restored in Christ. Now, this means that our hearts have to be filled with love. Um, number 11, love is therefore the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. Christian revelation recognizes two specific ways of realizing the vocation of every human being to love. And the vocation is either marriage or virginity. Now, the first time I read this, I was like, oh my gosh, Holy Father. This just seems like really hard to unpack. But the truth is, is that once our hearts are renewed in Christ through our baptism, through our confirmation, you know, we're learning how to walk in the Lord, our virginity, our person, is for Christ alone. And so every man and every woman is called to virginity. Now, I have never been this specific about this, but we also have a culture that is fighting the human person, right? And so now we have to go, let's go back to the beginning, right? What did Jesus say? Let's go back to the beginning. It's a very good place to start, okay? So he is saying, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Why did I make the human person? And the human person is first and foremost created to be in a relationship with God Most High. Your supreme calling is the Holy Trinity. <laughs> that is your supreme calling. The meaning of your life is God himself. 
your fulfillment, it's here. It's now. It's happening. It's God. And it's in that supreme calling that you find your vocation, your vocation to serve and your vocation to love, your human vocation, which is your calling. But it begins with God. And so your person, your virginity is yours. Even if somebody takes it from you, it's still yours. So you can take it back. And this is so important so that you understand that the gift of your person is the whole gift of your femininity or your masculinity, your sexuality, that this is something that you are created with. And you can make a lot of changes to your body. Like I could dye my hair and I could totally change the way I look, but I will never, ever be able to give myself a Y chromosome. Okay? So this whole sexuality thing and being a human person is a gift from God. He created them male and he created them female. And he created them to be one, like the Trinity. We are made in the image and likeness of God, who is Trinitarian. We are made for unity. We are made for undivided love. It's what we're made for. And so the enemy can throw everything against us that's possible. It will never be undone, and it will never be changed, because in the beginning, God created us male and female. And so by getting the kids and ourselves in touch with the fact that we are a gift, if we can teach this really well, that each person is a gift. And you can have kids that come to you and say, but I feel like I'm this, and I feel like I'm this, and I feel like I'm this. All of it, right? And you can just say, in the beginning it wasn't so. In the beginning it wasn't messed up. In the beginning there was no brokenness. There was no confusion. The world was in perfect harmony. God was in perfect harmony with Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve were in perfect harmony with God. And guess what? Adam and Eve were totally one. They totally loved each other and gave themselves as a gift to each other. If I give you a gift and you give me a gift, we're both gifted, right? Even in our giving, our self-giving, we're receiving, right? And that's how God intended it to be. And everything got messed up when sin entered the world. And so what the Holy Father wants to do is he wants to call us back to Jesus Christ, and he wants us to understand that when bodies unite in sexual love, the soul is to unite too. And that can only happen with grace. So this is an image I've used with my high school kids. Okay, you ready? You can have a guy and a girl in a gymnasium, and they can run at each other 100 million miles an hour. Boom. Body parts will fly. But they cannot unite their souls. So we are either going to use our bodies the way God intended us to with love and giftedness, or we are going to beat each other up with our bodies. But the union that Christ called man and woman to, in marriage, Christian marriage, and in the family, is something that is so great and so high and so beautiful and so loving that it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for. This is what one of the early church fathers taught on page three. Tertullian said this, how can I ever express the happiness of the marriage that is joined together by the church, strengthened by an offering, sealed by a blessing, announced by the angels, and ratified by the Father. How wonderful the bond between two believers with a single hope, a single desire, a single observance, and a single service. There is no separation between them in spirit or flesh. In fact, they are truly two in one flesh, and where the flesh is one, there is the spirit. That's what Christian marriage is. 
It's so beautiful. And so it has to be taught with such love. I remember my little sister when she went on her first date in high school with Scott. She came home from the first date. She laid on the floor in our bedroom. Ugly carpet. I can still remember the red stripes, the green stripes, and the white stripes. And she said, he held my hand. <laughs> it was her first date. That's the gift. That's the theology of the body. It's when I reverently hold your hand. And in time, if God wills this grows into marriage, I reverently hold your hand life. And you reverently hold my life. We hold each other in grace with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. What does this remind you of? The Holy Mass with him, through him, in him, in the unity, unity, good idea for marriage, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory be to God the Father almighty. And yes, it does glorify him. It glorifies him. When we learn to let him love through this heart anyway, right? That we can lay down our life and love this other person for his or her own sake in a lifelong committed marriage. Impossible. For men and women, impossible. But for God, nothing is impossible. Amen? Is this helpful? Are you getting fired up to teach about marriage? Oh, we can have so much fun, you know? Because, because we can, you can do your skits and your dramas. You can have a big heart with the Holy Eucharist on it. You can have all the ways that our relationships are being attacked. But you got to have a big, strong Jesus. Because that is what Jesus did when he loved us as the bridegroom of the church on the cross. He was a big, strong Jesus. And Jesus, through love, kicked off all the demons and made a way for us anyway. And this is possible for us. Part three, the role of the Christian family. Family, this is on the bottom of page, oh, I'm sorry, guys. I think it's page five. My numbers didn't come out clearly. Part three, the role of Christian family. Oh, okay, we're doing good. Is it? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yep, I got, a half a, I got a half a line there. Family, become what you are. Family, become what you are, an intimate community of life and love. The family has the mission to become more and more what it is called, that is, a community of life and love, in an effort that will find fulfillment as will everything created and redeemed in the kingdom of God. So the role of the Christian family, so every human person is called to virginity or called to marriage. And then in holy marriage, you give the gift of your virginity, the gift of yourself to another person. And I have to tell you, I have a daughter in high school, and I think we just have to start teaching this way again. That's what they did in the ancient culture with the pagans, right? They'd be like, oh, remember St. Agnes, you know, virgin and martyr? Well, there was something that was really valued about her virginity, her personhood, she wasn't just going to give herself away to anybody. And it was the same with the men. They're not just going to give themselves away. Why? Because in Christ, we are baptized. In Christ, every woman is called to spiritual motherhood. And in Christ, every man is called to spiritual fatherhood. And you will either mother in the Holy Spirit or you will mother in hell. And you will either father in the Holy Spirit or you will father in hell. Does this make sense? Every person has a choice. Ooh, I get fired up, so it's kind of scary. Did that sound scary? It's the truth, though. You know what I mean? She looked like I scared her, but does it make sense? How many people got scared? Sorry. <laughs> but the thing is, think about it. You're teaching people to pray and to love and to do good deeds. 
And I'm not going to go into any of this, but all you have to do is go see the new movie that's out, Freedom. And you will see that there are other people who are mothering and fathering, and it is not in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. And so when we can distinguish good from evil and we make a choice that our choice is going to be love in the spirit, we can see then how Jesus Christ radically loved us. We can see why sisters and priests radically love Christ. We, it's not, it's everybody now. Christy Fideli Lacey called everyone into the vineyard. St. John Paul II called you two go into my vineyard. Everybody is called to a radical love and commitment to Jesus Christ. Right, sister? It is. She does, she's like, come on, guys. I need you. I need you. I need you. Okay? So, so, we're, so that we understand that we're in this together. And so then with that, we can challenge our kids to purity. Because guess what? It doesn't matter what you are right now. I told a young man this who was 13, who was struggling with maybe he was, you know, had this problem, okay? And I looked at him and I said, well, that's fine. While you're figuring this out, we'll pray, but you're called to virginity right now. And he's like, I am? I said, yeah, you really don't need to worry about this unless you get married. And then, of course, if you do get married, you need to, if you want to follow Christ, it needs to be a Christian marriage. So everything's taken care of. And he honestly looked at me and started laughing. He goes, thank you so much. It was kind of heavy for me. <laughs> He's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, here we go. Back to this. Okay, so forming a community of persons. So the family has this mission then. So the husband and the wife are married they, in, in Christ. They, they give the gift of themselves to each other, and they start their family Children are the crown of marriage. So children are a gift to marriage. And I think it's really important to bring in people and have them witness to your youth groups and to your classrooms the love for their children. Because some kids don't feel loved, and so they can experience hearing about the love of families. And other kids, they, they'll start to connect and realize that the gift of their family, that their mom cares about them and their dad actually gives them rules, that that's actually a gift. Does this make sense? So it's like we can't take the gift of families and children for granted. They're the crown of marriage. They're the only thing you can take to heaven with you. You can't take any of your stuff to heaven. You can't take any of the fun to heaven and you can't take any technology to heaven. You can only take your families. I remember my son, um, one of my sons, going to the University of Minnesota and bringing home a student who was from China for a weekend. And we were just having a good weekend, having some family meals together, and at Saturday night, we're having a nice candlelight dinner. I like candles all the time for all of our family meals. I always light candles. I have two candlesticks. We've had them for 33 years. They've been lit almost every night for dinner. And it's just that light of Christ burning at our table. And this young man looks at me at the end of the night, and he says, do you do this all the time? And I said, yes, we do. And he said, oh, he says, in my country, we can only have one child and my parents are required to live separately because they have jobs in different districts. So he was fascinated with our family and was sleeping on the couch reading the books of the lives of the saints, you know? And I got pictures of Jesus up and Mary up and the whole thing, right? Never talked about Jesus, yet Jesus was talking the entire time. Amen? And, and so if we, can, if we can make experiences of this, like for our families, in our classrooms, in our youth groups, and just try to help people to understand that love begins in their heart, and then they can take that heart back to their families. And when you have people come in from your parishes to give testimonies or witnesses, I would find people I would just pray and look for people who could share their stories. Had this one woman, Louise, who came in. She was 78 years old, and she came in just to share with the teens in a classroom situation what it was like when her husband died. 
and how she missed him and how she didn't know how she was going to go on without him and how she felt a hand on her shoulder. And she felt peace go through her, and she knew that her husband was with Jesus because of this experience. And these kids are just like, she goes, and then little Louise just looked at him and said, so kids, this is it. You need Jesus. you got to go to church, so make sure you go. And if your parents won't take you, I will. <laughs> and the kids would look for her at church then. So it's a really cool way to connect your people with the community and the schools because part of this whole family situation is many families live extended families. That's considered community, but also just in your communities that there's people out there, and so we can reach out to them at all times. And how do we do this? We're to guard love, reveal love, and communicate love. That's the role of the family. So how does the family guard love, and in the family of God, guard love? So when we think about guard love, reveal love, and communicate love, I'm talking about the individual families, but I'm also talking about your youth programs. So I'm just going to throw out some ideas. So like guard love. I had a young person who came on one of my mission trips. He did not want to come at all. His dad put him on the bus. His dad asked permission if I would let him put this young man and his sister on the bus two days before our mission trip. How many youth ministers would just say no? Two days before a trip. Amen. I'm with you. I wanted to say no really bad. There's just one problem. I could not say no to this father because his wife had passed away that year and they were in a crisis situation and he was desperate. And so I made some calls and I did the paperwork and I asked people to pray and we let him come on the bus. And so he came on the bus, the dad dropped him off, the daughter hugged his father, the son had nothing to do with his father, got on the bus with his hands like this. I greeted him, didn't say too much, don't ever say too much in the beginning, and put him on the bus. On the way home, we have sharing on the bus. All of a sudden, this young man comes to the front of the bus. The whole bus goes quiet. He gets up to the front, and his sister's in the back, and he's like, yo, Adrian. <laughs> Not really, but you know what I'm talking about. And he starts talking to his sister, and he says, I just got to say, as all of you know, I really did not want to come on this trip. My dad made me go. My sister and I and my dad, we lost our mom last year. And then he talked to his sister. And I've been a bad brother ever since. I've been drinking. I've been doing drugs. I've been doing things I shouldn't be doing. And he says, and I'm going to change. And she comes up. And she's just this tiny thing. And he's holding her. Everybody on the bus. It's like a Hallmark moment. Everybody's crying, you know. And that was it. That's how you guard love. You guard love by doing tough things. You have, when people ask something from you with your youth program, if you have a type A personality, you have to say to somebody who doesn't, should I be merciful here? You know? And if you have somebody asking you to go on your trip and you let everybody come, then you need to go to a type A person and say, should I let this person go on my trip? Because sometimes you got to say no. Does this make sense? And this is why we have to pray. So this young man came on this trip. His father guarded love, the church guarded love, and he was healed. And the family was healed. And they could go forward. And so when John Paul said, we have to guard love, we have to guard love. Number two, we have to reveal love. It's not enough to talk about it. It's not, it will never change anybody's heart to just sit and talk about love and then be mean. To sit and talk about love and be prideful and unforgiving. To sit and talk about love and go out and do the opposite. And so what Jesus is looking for is people who will let, not perfect people, let me tell you that right now. <laughs> you know what? I got to tell you this. It's really funny. This just man falls seven times a day. 
I had that Bible verse memorized, then I got the other half, and the Lord God delivers them from every fall. And I, I, you know, I was doing the Stations of the Cross one, son, one week. When my life is hard and tough, I do the Stations of the Cross, then I go shopping. <laughs> Good sister? Sister says yes, do those Stations. <laughs> so I was doing the Stations of the Cross, and I got to the one where Jesus fell three times at our church, and I don't know why, but his face, you know, it's just smushed in the ground. I was like, Jesus, you look terrible. You look just like me. And he's like, right away I heard him say, I made the ground holy. I made the ground holy. His death, his wounds healed us. He made that ground holy. He made your faults holy. He made you holy. Just invite him into the brokenness. Invite him into the habits that are not pleasing to you. Invite him, invite him in. Jesus, help me change. I remember when, this was years ago, my holy priest said, you need to give up those cigarettes now. So yeah, I would sneak a few smokes. I had them in my freezer. He says, I think it's time for you to give these up. And I was like, oh, Father, I don't smoke that much. Are you sure? He said, yep, it's time. So next time I see you, he said, did you do it? I go, oh, Father, I started smoking more than ever when you told me I had to. Give them up, right? He goes, oh, don't do that. He goes, okay, so just pray about it. Just pray about it. So I said, okay, I could do that. So I did not pray about it for like three weeks. And then it's time to see Father again. So I'm like, okay, I got to pray about this. So one night I'm praying about it. And this is what I hear. Jesus, you know I don't smoke that much. Do you want me to quit? And I hear a line from Macbeth. Oh, damn spot out. <laughs> Do you remember that? Macbeth? That was, you remember that? I, said, I started laughing. I just burst out laughing. I said, okay, Jesus, if you really want me to stop, I give you full permission to take this away from me. But I don't want to stop but I give you permission to take it away. So guess what happens? I go out for dinner next week with my husband, pull my smokes out of the freezer, put them in my purse. We have dinner, then we go out on the patio. I go to light one up, guess what? I start coughing. It burns all the way down. I go, oh no. <laughs> my husband goes, what's going on? I go, this is making me sick. He goes, well don't throw them away, they're expensive. I, I have to tell you, he completely took it away from me, completely. So what I learned from that was that invite him into your struggles. Invite him into your bad habits. Talk to him about it. Ask him to help you. God will help us with grace, you know? And he loves us where we're at. He accepts us. He loves us. And he wants us to know that he has revealed love to us in Jesus Christ, and he wants us to invite him in and become the best we can so that we can reveal love to other people. With that, I got sidetracked there. With, with that one, I wanted to share the story of revealing love. My, I was working with my high school kids, and I, had to, I wanted to interview people on how they knew they were loved. And so I asked my little sister... I said, Krista, how do you know that you are loved by God? How do you know that? And she goes, oh, that's easy. I go, it's easy? She goes, yeah, for me, it's always been easy. I said, why is that? She said, well, you remember when mom was pregnant with me, they told her that she could die. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's right. So my mother... My sister Krista was the eighth child. My mother almost died having Michelle, who was the seventh child. And she was told, don't have any more babies because, because you can't carry any more children. And so her and dad, my dad is a Catholic doctor, NFP, they were practicing that. But they had never really practiced it to not have children. And so they started doing NFP and abstaining, and dad understood it, mom understood it, and they prayed, and it worked just fine for about six years. And then she got pregnant with Krista. And it was, it was really a, quite an ordeal, and I remembered this when she said it. 
because we were all little, but we remember my mom crying and dad talking to her and, and dad calling all of us to pray for mom. Anyway, Krista was born without a hitch. But Krista knew her whole life that my mother laid her life down for her. So she said because she knew that my mother had been willing to lay her life down for her, my mother revealed love to her. She had no problem believing that Jesus Christ would lay down his life for the world. Isn't that beautiful? That's revelation. That's to reveal love. And then the third thing that the Holy Father asked for was to communicate love. And so in communicating love, we are to sometimes just really speak clearly what God wants to say to the people we're with. And we have to sometimes, I'm looking for the next thing I want to do here. We have to sometimes be willing to do the things that are difficult. And I just want to give this example of my father when my, one of my siblings, my brother, had stopped practicing the faith. And my mom and dad knew it. And I just remember one night, Lyle stopped in to visit, and dad just said to him, I hear you're not going to church anymore. And he said, yeah, I'm not. And my dad just said, well, your faith is the most important thing that you have. Don't throw it away. And when you're ready, you get yourself back to Mass, and you get yourself to confession. And he said it a little bit more German than that. <laughs> okay? But you want to know what? He said it. And he said it with love. And I think sometimes that these hard conversations with our students, I've had kids really struggle with their faith, and I'll say, you can struggle all you want, but you need to get to Mass. You need to be humble. Because if God is going to form you and work with you, you have to be humble. You have to realize that you're this big and God is... You have to understand that. And so I had a young woman who was going to walk away from the church, 11th grader. She walked into my office, and she said, all right, I've given it all a chance. Nothing's changed. I'm done. I said, you're done? She said, yep, I'm done with God. I'm done with church. I gave it a chance. 11th grader. And I believe she was going to leave. And I said, would you want to sit down for a minute? I have no idea, once again, what I'm going to say. But I'm just asking the Holy Spirit, what should I say? And she sits down, and above her head is a cross on the wall. It's not hanging there. It's on the wall. And I feel inspired in that moment just to grab the cross off the wall and put it in her hands. And this is something now I've done as a prayer in youth group. I'll use a crucifix and pass the cross and let, with music playing and let them talk to Jesus from their hearts after I tell this story. And so she, as she held Jesus, she looks at me and the crucifix, and she says, what? What? Reveal love. I said, what else does he have to do for you? She says, what do you mean? I said, what else does he have to do for you? You said you're walking away. You're done. What else does he have to do for you? And she looks at the cross, and then she really looks at it. And I just told her, his hands and feet were pierced for you. For every time your feet has walked to sin, and every time somebody has taken their hand and broken you, his head was crowned with thorns for every bad thought you've ever had and every bad thought or accusation that's come against you. His heart was pierced for your broken heart, and he was beaten all over his body for all of the ways that you have been beaten in your body, in your young life, that would make you walk away from the God of love. And this little girl takes this cross, she puts it up to her heart, and she starts crying. And I saw an 11th grader receive the gospel. She goes, got all done, it's completely quiet, 
And she goes, now what do I do? I go, I think you need to go to confession. She goes, I just went. I go, yeah, but you didn't confess the big one. She goes, what was the big one? I said, you didn't believe in the love of Jesus Christ. She goes, oh, my gosh, that's a sin? I go, yes. <laughs> we are called to love Jesus Christ the way he loves us. And so we got to love him. We got to love Jesus, and we got to be like, Jesus freaks. I remember this lady, she goes, I said to her when I was working at this one parish, I said, gosh, I haven't been invited to any of the parties or the social things in the families. She goes, that's because you're into Jesus. I go, oh. She goes, yeah, you're kind of Jesus. I go, yeah. She goes, oh. I go, and if you hang around me, you're going to become just like me. <laughs> Two years later, she goes, we we're out one night having dinner. She was my secretary. She goes, oh, my gosh. She goes, I'm just like you. <laughs> Okay, so we're to guard love, reveal love, and communicate love. Now, I wanted to, in the last minutes we have together, um, I wanted to just give you, I wanted to just give you four ideas of practical things that you can do at your parish if you want to. The first thing is, is that I am seeing at different parishes in the country, families are doing family faith formation night. And I went into a family, and I was a speaker. And I have to tell you, I prayed so hard. I was so scared. I thought, well, I'll just try it once. If it doesn't work, I'll never go back. But they had th three to 400 people there, and it was all age levels. The middle school kids were all sit. They had a big dinner, and the night was called, they called their night Unify. And they had a, the Knights of Columbus put on a lovely barbecue. They all came in after work and ate. And then they came into the gym. They had good music. And they had just a bunch of chairs out. We had an opening prayer. And then I did a talk based on the family. And I have to tell you that even with two-year-olds there and stuff, it felt chaos, but I was at peace. But because of the, the prayer they had around it and that they set up a good meal and they had some good music and they dimmed the lights nice and they had a really nice strong light on me, I... It, it worked. And what was really cool is all these dads and moms were there. And so to do a talk on the family and to do a talk on marriage, and then we had all these middle school and high school kids that were right up front. I just couldn't believe it. It went really well. And so I think that if you're thinking about trying to do this, to pray about it, and to talk to your knights, and to talk to you know, just to, to try it because I see this happening. I do see it happening that families just want to come together. They want to be together for the night. They're tired. They need dinner. Like, they got to feed them. But if you can give them a good message. And then what we did at the end of the night, which was new for them, but I had this idea and it went over well, so you could, you could do this simple. We made sure there was a statue of the Blessed Mother on the um, stage. I have to tell you, I, I would YouTube the mama bear and the cougar because you could so show that to a family. They would get it. Everybody would get it. And then what we did is the family circled up. And anybody who was there without a family, they, we, the icebreaker we did was um, take a picture of your family and anybody that's next to you that needs a family. And so the groups formed and they did selfies. And then those were sent into the church to do a bulletin board later. And then at the end of the night, everybody got together, and we called upon the Blessed Mother, and we did a deck out of the rosary together. All the families were in holy huddles praying the deck out of the rosary. And as we went through each intention, we prayed for every evil coming against their families. And the, the report that came back to their pastor was that that part of the night was the most powerful. I wonder why. Yeah, that's the Blessed Mother. So... Um, and I wanted to just let you know there is um, a book that um, I, I got and read a couple years ago that is called um, uh, Mary in the 19th Century, and it's called The Woman Will Conquer, and it goes through every apparition of the Blessed Mother from the 1800s through the 1900s. When I finish this book, it's not hard to read. I go, oh, my gosh, she must be exhausted. 
Like you could just see how Mary is working to save humanity. So it, it just gave me a little bit more edge to keep that rosary going. I have noticed with youth group and with speaking, if I do even a Hail Mary before I do a talk or, or with the youth groups or whatever, a decade if I can, I'll have kids come up. Oh my gosh, this one boy, he's up there, he's like, I'll lead. I'm like, you're a leader. He gets up there, he's stumbling through the Our Father and the Hail Marys. Everybody's laughing, but I can, I can tell you what, I just kept encouraging him and going with it, and eventually by the third Hail Mary, the whole group was praying. So it's, does this make sense? They, they get uncomfortable because they haven't learned how to pray together, but we just lead and keep stepping forward, keep stepping forward. Okay, another idea is intentions. See if you can include intentions at your mass to pray for your families. Help the people who are writing the intentions. The families are stressed out. Marriages are stressed out. So you could literally have at Sunday mass, we want to lift up all married couples who are struggling with boom, boom, and boom. We pray to the Lord, right? We want to lift up all families who are struggling with children who are sick, or anxious, or whatever, just to try to get intentions being prayed so that they realize that God knows that they're here, they're at church, and we're praying for them at church. Is that a little connection? That's a simple one. Another idea is prayer chains. Any Find the people in your parishes that pray. And I know at, to, uh, at um, different parishes, they have one or two people who's charge of the prayer chain, and all they have to do is call one person and it fires right through the prayer chain. But families that you're working with, if you, as youth ministers, you can't do all this prayer. Jesus showed me this. He's like, you got to pray every day as youth ministers, and you'll get more of that in your spirituality talk. But if you have people, parents that come to you, and they're struggling, and you say, hey, I'm going to, call the prayer chain. Can I put you on it? No names. Just get your family on there. Prayer chains are connect with people who pray. My sister who's consecrated taught me this. She said the nuns are going to pray anyway. The brothers are going to pray anyway. But if they get a picture of a youth group or if they get a name of a family, that's going to go up in the adoration chapel and you are going to get prayers. Okay? So I make friends with the brothers and the sisters. Amen, sister? Yeah, we, I, have, I have some nuns now. My husband just started writing to these nuns. And it took about two years. And finally, we got a letter back. And it was just this lovely letter. And she goes, we are your sisters in Christ. And I was like, amen. <laughs> okay, let's see if I got one more thing here. Okay, um, I wanted to ask, um, oh, this is another quick thing. Groups. If there's any way that you can help, it, like I know you're youth ministers, but if there's any way that you can do anything to build small groups. So like, first of all, with your core teams, by bringing them, like in, having somebody in your core just host a night and you come together and you just have food and then people bring stuff and then you just go in the living room and you do like a youth group with your core team, do high point, low point, then do Lexio, and then sit together in the quiet, and then pray for each other. Because once you start teaching your core how to do this, then you can teach. They'll be able to do that with the teens and small groups. And then they can also invite other families into their homes and so I know families that are meeting. I'm in a family group where we meet twice a month on a Sunday, and that's what we do. We bring food. Then we get in the living room. The kids play. We do high point and low point. Then we read scripture. We do Lexio, and we pray for each other. It's so simple. But what happens is, is by teaching and getting small groups going, and I know that's in line with the synod and all the things that are being required, but I think, I think the church is really on with this.